Have you ever asked for power, wealth, or success in your prayers? What if God's answer points you in a completely different direction? In this video, we are talking about James the Greater. We'll go over his character profile, one key moment from the Bible, lessons we can learn from James and Jesus, life after Jesus' ascension, and his martyrdom. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Autumn and I would like to change the world through faith-driven and brave conversations. This video is a part of a series that I call Disciples of Christ, where I do deep dives on all of the 12 disciples. So if you're interested in that, make sure that you hit that like button, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell so that you don't miss out on a single story. Let the games quiet down. Begin. So the name James is actually the Greek and Latin form of the Hebrew name Yaakov, which is also spelled out to be Jacob. The meaning behind Jacob or Yaakov is he who supplants or may God protect. It carries a similar meaning to the Old Testament patriarch Jacob, who supplanted or took over the birthright. The greater part of James's name just separates him from the other disciple who was also named James. The term greater doesn't necessarily mean that he was more important. It likely refers to his seniority either in age or in his early calling by Jesus. James was the son of Zebedee, a wealthy fisherman, and his mother was Salome, who is speculated to have some relation or be a close relative of Mary, the mother of Jesus, but that is not specifically said in scripture. James likely lived in Bethsaida or Capernaum. Both towns are near the Sea of Galilee in Northern Israel. James was probably in his late teens or early twenties during his time with Jesus. He was probably roughly 20 to 30 years old when Jesus called him. This was a common age for Jewish men to be a part of a family business or to be followers of a rabbi. James, like the other disciples, his brother and his father was a fisherman by trade. Fishing was actually a common occupation near the Sea of Galilee. James and John, along with his father, had several boats and hired workers, suggesting that they might have been prosperous and pretty wealthy in fishing. Fishermen in this time were often hardworking and lived modest lives, spending long hours on the waters and selling their catch at the local markets. Fishing was both labor intensive and financially unpredictable. It depended on the weather and the success of daily catches. It does not mention um, that James had a wife or children, but in the cultural context of first century Judaism, it is pretty common for somebody of James's age to be married. If James had family, it is possible that they are not mentioned by the gospels because the gospels really wanted to focus on his role as an apostle and his missionary work rather than his personal life. Let's get into the positive traits that James had. James had zeal and he was very passionate. In fact, James and his brother John were nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. They were given this name by Jesus, possibly because of their fiery enthusiasm to share the message of Jesus and often their desire to defend him. His zeal reflects a deep passion for the kingdom of God. James was also courageous and faithful to Jesus. James' willingness to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, even when it meant personal danger and sacrifice, illustrates his deep faith. He never wavered in his loyalty to Jesus, even after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. He continued in his mission of spreading the gospel. Now let's get into his negative traits. James was often impulsive and overconfident. He also lacked compassion at times. You can actually see this when he wanted to call fire on his enemies. He also struggled with understanding, but as I continue to do more research on the disciples and more episodes, I realized that almost all the disciples thus far that I've covered have this struggle as well. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. Let's talk about one key moment from the Bible that really just shows who James was as a person in his transformation after meeting Jesus. Okay, so the moment that I decided to talk about when it comes to James is the moment that him and his brother John asked Jesus to sit on his right and left hand. So this uh, story is only depicted in Mark and Matthew. And I decided to read Matthew's version because he adds an additional detail about James and John's um, mother, Salome. The detail is not really important, but I just wanted to include every aspect of this story. And so we're just going to read 
Matthew's version. This will be in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. And I will be reading the ESV version, which is the easy to read. Then Zebedee's wife came to Jesus and brought her sons. She bowed before Jesus and asked him to do something for her. Jesus said, what do you want? She said, promise that one of my sons will sit at your right side in your kingdom and the other at your left. So Jesus said to the sons, you don't understand what you're asking. Can you drink from the cup that I must drink from? The sons answered, yes, we can. Jesus said to them, it is true that you will drink from the cup that I drink from but it is not for me to say who will sit on my right or my left my father has decided who will do that he has prepared those places for them the other 10 followers heard this and were angry with the two brothers so jesus called the followers together he said you know that the rulers of the non-jewish people love to show their power over the people and their important leaders love to use all their authority over the people but it should not be that way with you Whoever wants to be your leader must be your servant. Whoever wants to be the first must serve the rest of you like a slave. Do as I did. The son of man did not come for people to serve him. He came to serve others and to give his life to save many people. I first want to address Salome, who is John and James's mother. So Salome approaches Jesus on the behalf of her sons. This was actually pretty common for mothers to advocate for their children. She didn't do this maliciously or with any malicious intent behind her son's back. This wasn't just something that she took initiative in. From James and John's response after Jesus asked them if they could drink from the same cup that he would, it suggests that they were actually all on a familial accord, meaning they were all in unity with this idea that they would ask or she would ask Jesus if James and John could sit on his right and left hand. Hand. Now you're probably wondering why was this question such a big deal and what exactly were James and John and Salome really asking for? To really give you the answer to that we have to kind of take you back to the context and the times of this moment. The disciples including James and John were living in the first century Judea, a time where the Jewish people were under Roman occupation. The Jewish people had long awaited the coming of the Messiah, a promised deliverer who would restore Israel's independence and usher in a new era of peace and prosperity. Many of the Jews at that time interpreted Old Testament prophecies, especially those in Isaiah and Daniel, as predicting a powerful and earthly ruler who would overthrow their oppressors and establish a literal kingdom on earth. Rome's rule over Judea was very harsh during this time, and the Jewish people deeply resented it. Many Jews hoped for political freedom, and they believed the Messiah would lead a rebellion to overthrow Roman authority and restore Israel to its prior glory under the kings like King David and King Solomon. To give you some examples of Roman authority over the Jewish people, they were heavily taxed and often those tax collectors were corrupt. This caused widespread resentment amongst the Jewish population. Rome also had a strong military presence amongst the Jews. They did this to suppress Jewish uprising and ensue order. Any rebellion or resistance to Roman authority was met with harsh punishments including mass executions and crucifixions. While the Romans allowed some religious freedoms, they still interfered with Jewish religious practices. For example, Roman officials controlled the appointments of the high priest, influencing temple affairs and Jewish leadership. Roman culture, including its language, laws, and customs were imposed on the Jewish people. And this often interfered with their religious traditions and practices. This created significant tensions between the the Jewish people and the Roman authorities. So in the mindsets of the Jews of that time, the Messiah was expected to be a warrior king. They envisioned him of overthrowing their enemies, setting up a kingdom in Jerusalem and bringing about a new era of dominance and prosperity. So John's and James request to sit on the right and left side of Jesus actually aligns with the framework of the expectation of the Jewish people for the Messiah. They believed that Jesus was the long awaited Messiah who would overthrow the Romans and establish his kingdom and take up his rightful place as king. In their eyes, asking to sit beside him in positions of honor and power was a natural desire for those closest to him since they were expecting a political and military victory. So what's the deal with this right and left hand thing? In ancient monarchies, sitting at the right and left hand of a king symbolized positions of great power 
and authority. James and John wasn't asking for small roles. They wanted to be second only to Jesus in the coming kingdom, ruling aside him as key figures in his administration. They anticipated sharing the spoils of victory. Perhaps they anticipated wealth, prestige, and influence amongst the Jewish people. All things closely tied to earthly power. Overall, their request was born out of misunderstanding of Jesus' ultimate mission. They thought that he would lead them to material prosperity and national glory. I want to pause here and ask you a question. Are there things you're asking Jesus for, such as success, wealth, or comfort that may not align with his true purpose and mission for your life? How might your expectations differ from the deeper transformation Jesus desires for you? Really ponder that. Go on now. Mm -hmm. Now let's discuss the contrast between their expectations and Jesus' ultimate mission. Jesus' mission was radically different from what the disciples and most of the Jews of the time expected. We already established that. I kind of broke it down a little bit. He didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom like the Jews expected, but a spiritual one. One where greatness is defined by servanthood, sacrifice, and love not political or material wealth. Jesus repeatedly made it clear that his kingdom was not of this world. He came to reign in the hearts of people, bringing salvation, forgiveness, and eternal life rather than military conquest or political dominance. His ultimate mission focused on spiritual deliverance, not freeing Israel from Rome. In contrast to the conquering king everybody expected, Jesus embodied the role of the suffering servant which was depicted in Isaiah chapter 53. His path led to the cross, not to a throne in Jerusalem. He showed that true leadership and greatness is about serving others, even to the point of laying down one's life. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness in Matthew chapter four, Satan actually offered him all the kingdoms of the world. But what did Jesus do? Jesus rejected that earthly power, choosing instead the way of humility and sacrifice. He demonstrated that God's kingdom operates on entirely different principles than worldly kingdoms. So I know what y'all asking. Y'all probably like, okay, so what did this, how does this correlate to me? Like, what can I do with this information? Well, we about to break it down, okay? Sit with me. All right. So first, you need to redefine success. Society tells us that success is measured by titles, wealth, or influence. Jesus teaches us that true success in God's eyes is found in humility and serving others. You can embody James by shifting your mindset from striving for personal elevation and asking yourself, how can I serve others and build them up? What gifts have God given me that I can use to build up others and serve them? Another thing you can do is practice humility in your everyday interactions. This can look like being willing to listen, give others the spotlight, and don't feel the need to take control of every situation or receive recognition. In relationships, this could mean seeking the good of other people rather than seeking personal gain. At work, this could mean helping out a coworker or colleague without expecting anything in return or without expecting praise or recognition for what you did. This next one is a pretty hard one to digest. And another way that you can embody James in this moment is embrace sacrifice in your relationships and in your commitments. Being willing to sacrifice your time, energy, and resources for others reflects the heart of God. This might mean giving up your personal time to help out a friend or to be a mentor to another person, or even sacrificing financially to support a cause that serves others. When we prioritize the needs of others, even when it costs us something, we are living out the transformation that James experienced after Jesus corrects his ambition. Focus on eternal values. In today's culture, we often prioritize temporary worldly goals like wealth, fame, or status. But like James, after his transformation, we could shift our mindset into what truly matters in the kingdom of God. Acts of love, justice, and mercy. By investing in our relationships, building up communities, people can live out this kingdom focused life. One of the biggest lessons we can take from this is to trust in God's plan over our own ambition. Surrender your ambition to God's will. Like James, we must often surrender our own personal ambitions for a career, wealth and success in favor of God's greater 
plan. This requires trusting that God knows best, even when the path he sets before us is not what we envisioned. Be transformed like James by allowing God's purposes to direct your life and career choices and be open to redirection. James thought that his path to greatness would be through earthly positions of power, but Jesus showed him a new path, one of service and sacrifice. Be open to God redirecting your life, even if it means giving up some personal dream or ambition for something greater. This could mean making life decisions based on serving others rather than advancing personal wealth or status such as choosing a less lucrative career that has a greater impact on people or devoting your time and resources to charitable work rather than personal gain. Now, let's talk about James Demise. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Tradition holds that James continued to preach the gospel after Jesus' ascension, primarily in Jerusalem and the other regions surrounding it. According to Spanish tradition, James traveled to Spain to spread Christianity, though there is no biblical account of this mission. James holds the distinction of being the first of the 12 disciples to be martyred. Herod Agrippa I was the grandson of Herod the Great, who ruled during Jesus' birth. Herod the Great was appointed king over Judea by the Roman emperor. His rule was marked by a close relationship with Jewish religious leaders, and he sought to maintain favor with them. Christianity at this time was viewed with suspicion and hostility by many Jewish authorities because it was seen as a heretical sect breaking from traditional Jewish tradition. As the Christian movement grew after Jesus ascended into heaven, so did the tension between Christian and Jewish leaders. Herod Agrippa I, Herod the Great's grandson, was looking for ways to strengthen his political standing with the Jewish leaders. He saw the persecution of Christian leaders was a way to gain favor with influential Jewish groups such as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Executing prominent Christian figures would eliminate a perceived threat, but also gain him popularity. James was a high profile apostle, okay? He was a part of Jesus' inner circle, along with Peter and John. As one of the leading voices in the early Christian church, his influence made him a natural target for persecution. By killing James, Herod Agrippa I was trying to send a strong message to the Christian community, and he wanted to discourage further growth of the Christian movement. James's death was actually recorded in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. It says that James was put to death with the sword. This was around 44 AD. James would have been around 40 years old. This form of execution indicates that James was likely beheaded, which was a common method of capital punishment during that time. Time. In the Roman world, beheading was reserved for high profile criminals or leaders. This indicates James's significant role in the early Christian church. James's execution did not happen in secret. It was a part of a public campaign initiated by Herod Agrippa I to suppress the Christian movement and to gain favor in the eyes of the Jewish leaders. His martyrdom was likely intended to be a spectacle, reinforcing the power of Herod Agrippa I's rule and striking fear in the early Christian community. After James was killed, Herod Agrippa I saw how this pleased the Jewish authorities and proceeded to arrest Peter as well. This indicates that James's execution was a part of a broader effort to crush the leadership of the early Christian church. James' martyrdom marked the beginning of a mass execution of Christians and the apostles and overall the early Christian church. His death signified his deep faith and commitment to the message of Christ, even at the cost of his life. We can actually learn something from James's death and Peter's. James's willingness to suffer for the gospel shows that even when your service becomes difficult or goes unnoticed, persevering in love and sacrifice is where true greatness lies. In conclusion, the story of James the Greater, from his bold request to sit at Jesus' right hand to his eventual martyrdom, is a powerful reminder of the transformation that occurs when we fully commit to following Jesus. James's journey teaches us that true greatness in God's kingdom does not rely on wealth, status, power, success, whatever your personal ambition is leaning towards. But it is about humility, service, and sacrifice. His willingness to give his life for the gospel reflects the call for all believers to surrender their personal ambitions and embrace the higher purpose of serving 
others. In today's world, where worldly success is often prioritized, James's life and death reminds us that the true fulfillment comes from following Christ with the heart of faith and humility. His legacy challenges us to live out this calling on our own lives today. Period. Point. Blank. Let me stop. What did Jesus mean by calling Nathaniel a true Israelite? You can find that out by clicking on this video. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on next Friday's episode where I talk about Matthew. With that being said, let God do his part. Peace.